Okay, I should have given uh, BJ just a little bit of advance warning. I just want to read verses 9 through 11. So I have 10 and 11, as that, that is our text, but uh, I just want to read verse 9 in this as well. So James writes this, but the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too, the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening. Now, James has told us that the Lord will send trials. He's told us why, to purify us, to strengthen us, to, to work endurance in us, to complete us, to mature us. And he also reminded us um, not only of our need for wisdom to be able to make the best use of these trials, but he also told us how to get that wisdom from God, which is asking him. But asking him in faith without doubting, uh, because he will give it to us. If we doubt, we cannot expect to receive anything from him. Now, from there, James moved on to deal with, with two trials in particular, that of poverty and that of riches. Um, now, we, we've already looked at the first, and that's the one I mentioned before that we've probably had a taste of at some point in our lives because we all know the kind of pressures that lack of resources can bring, just like any other types of pressures in this world. But the lack of money... You know, we're concerned about food. You know, will we have what we need to sustain ourselves? Will we be able to keep our homes? Can we afford the medical care we need? You know, will we still be able to live when we can no longer work and do something to generate income? Now, James told us, remember, that we can rejoice even in this because when the Lord sends this leanness, He intends that, as He does all trials, for our good. We need to remember that God never brings anything into our lives simply to make our lives harder. There's always a good reason behind what he does. He does this out of his love for us because he wants us to grow. Now, James, remember, is later going to tell us that God more often chooses the poor to make them rich in faith. Poverty or that leanness will give us the pressure we need to seek after the Lord. Uh, the more then we look to Him, uh, the more we see Him meeting our needs as we look to Him in faith, the stronger our faith is going to become. And remember, a strong faith, as we saw last week, will open the door to many things. It will give us access to the riches of God's promises, which again, James told us we can't really have unless we have faith. It will produce in us a greater humility. Uh, the leanness creates the humility, the humble circumstances. And that will in turn promote greater service. I should say a stronger faith will also create a greater humility because we'll believe what Jesus says when he says it's the servant of all who is the greatest in the kingdom. And so we will humble ourselves and we will seek to serve. And in doing so, we'll gain a greater status in God's kingdom, a greater reward. And of course, a stronger faith will also give to us a greater assurance that the kingdom of heaven really belongs to us. And knowing that we have the riches of Christ's kingdom, that will help us to be content with less in this world and more thankful for what we have, what the Lord has given to us. Remember how Paul says he's learned the secret to being content you know, with having little or having a lot. And it's really because he was completely sold out to the Lord. He knew the true riches were his, so he could deal with having little. But he also knew how to deal with riches. I mean, he knew that the purpose behind God's giving them to him was that he might use them for God's glory. And he did. And again, that's going to be very key this evening. So this evening, I want us to consider the second trial, and that would be of prosperity. And that's probably something that we don't know a great deal about. As I mentioned before, James talks about really three groups of people, the same three that Agur spoke, spoke of in his prayer. 
you know, poverty and riches and then that which is proper for me, that which is right for me, that which the Lord knows I can handle. And uh, that's likely where we're all at right now. But again, we want to consider that of prosperity, the trial of prosperity. James says the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. Now, it's easy, it's so easy, and this is the snare that the rich fall into, and that is to trust their wealth rather than trusting God. James is trying to sort of level the field here when he's talking about the poor and the rich. He does deal with them in the letter. He wants us to understand that the, that the poor are no less important because they have less. Their, their poverty, their struggles will cause them to excel in faith, but the rich also are not superior because of their wealth. As a matter of fact, um, it's actually they are going to be humbled someday. And, and that, I think, is one of the reasons why there is a question here as to whether James is addressing wealthy believers or unbelievers here. Uh, it's, it, it is true that there were wealthy believers in the church. There were some who had wealth. Uh, we, we read in the book of Acts, remember, when all those people were converted to Pentecost and uh, they didn't want to go home right away because um, they wanted to learn more about Christ and they wanted to be discipled and they hadn't really planned on staying in Jerusalem that long. So this huge crowd hangs around. How are they going to be supported? Well, there were some disciples that had possessions. They had lands and they sold their properties and they gave the money to the apostles to take care of the needs of these new converts so that they could be discipled before they returned home. James is going to tell us in this letter that there are some who are attending the assemblies. And what he meant by that is they're coming to the worship services. They're wearing fine clothing and gold rings. And he says that in the context of making sure that the congregation makes sure that they don't treat these like royalty while treating the poor like second-class citizens. So there were those that actually did have possessions in, in the early church we might consider to be even wealthy. But James is also going to address rich unbelievers in his letter. I think some of these statements have to refer to unbelievers, such as in verse 6, he says, um, I, see, I'm, I think that's chapter 2, is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Okay, I don't think he's referring there to rich believers. And then he'll say in chapter 5, verse 1, come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. And the reason, being, the reason is because they're withholding Okay, they're withholding the, um, the pay of the laborers that they hired to do their work. That's not something a believer would do. Now, that appears to be what he's addressing in our passage. I think he's really referring here to rich unbelievers. The rich man is to glory in his humiliation, verse 10. The rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. He appears to be warning them warning the rich. Now, this is something we see Jesus doing throughout his ministry, warning the rich as well as promising blessings to the poor. Let me give you a few examples. He says in his sermon on the plain, and we find that in Luke's gospel, uh, it's believed that that's a separate sermon that Jesus preached. It's not Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount necessarily, but it's very similar. But he says in chapter 6, verses 20 and 21, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. And then he says conversely in verses 24 through 25, Woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. You know, as I read those words, I think about what Jesus said in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus that we looked at last week. Abraham's response to the rich man when he requested a drop of water to cool his tongue. He says, and again, in Luke's gospel, chapter 16, verse 25, child, remember that during your life you received your good things 
and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. Again, compare that with what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Plain. But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. You received your good things during your life. Lazarus, bad things. So you've had your blessings. You've received your inheritance. Now Lazarus is receiving his. Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry that he had come to bring the good news to the impoverished. Uh, chapter 4, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He said to the messengers of John, when they asked him if he was the expected one in Matthew 11, verses 4 and 5, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Think about what Jesus warns in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. And I think here he gives us a very important statement. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Notice, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Again, I think this passage gives us the key that we keep seeing over and over again to whether riches are a blessing or a curse. And the question is, are they our treasure? Or is God our treasure? You know, are we storing up treasures in heaven? Is that where our heart is? Or are we storing up treasures on earth? Now, if this wasn't his point here, when we consider everything else Jesus said about the rich, why would God give riches to any believer? But we do know that he, he does. He gives wealth to those who don't love it, but to those who love him and use the wealth to glorify him. Okay? We have examples of this as well. I mean, you know, you think, I, I think of, the, again, the health and wealth gurus. They like to point to the Old Testament to say that it's God's will that everyone be rich. And they'll point out, well, look, David was rich, Solomon was rich. Yes, but how did they use their riches? Okay? David used his immense wealth to provide the materials for the building of God's temple. I mean, the amount he gave was astronomical. As we noted before, the early believers who owned property, they didn't hold on to that property to be their security. They were able to use it to let go of it to support their needy brethren because they loved the Lord more. Think of Lydia of Thyatira. Remember the, the woman who was a seller of purple fabrics? She used her means to support Paul and Silas as they were ministering the gospel in Philippi. And then as we look in, in uh, church history, there's also another remarkable example, a woman by the name of Selena Hastings. If, if I were to ask you, are you familiar with her? You would probably say, I've never heard that name before. I hadn't either. But this woman was also known by another name, and that is the Countess of Huntington, the widow of the Earl of Huntington, who inherited great riches when her husband passed away. And she had then um, basically the uh, full use of all of those resources. Well, she used that wealth, and I think that's the reason why the Lord gave it to her, to promote the cause of Christ in England. When the churches were closed to Whitfield, remember because, uh, you know, as they saw Whitfield preaching, it was driving the prisoners crazy, uh, they were responding. He was not like their, their usual drones in the pulpit. He was preaching the gospel, and he was preaching a Calvinistic gospel. All the churches were closed to him, but she made Whitfield her chaplain and appointed him to preach in one of her London houses. She also held large dinner parties, inviting Whitfield to preach to her guests after dinner. And of course, among her, her guests were, were many dignitaries. It's said that Lady Huntington was actually responsible for founding 64 chapels 
And I learned from uh, Greg Hodson when he was here years ago that he actually candidated at one of the chapels that was still in operation that had been funded by a trust that she had established. Uh, so there are these, some of these chapels are actually still being funded. And they will only allow preachers who are Calvinists to preach there. And it's also said that she contributed to many others besides these 64 that she founded. Now, what is the difference? The difference is that these love God more than their wealth, and they use their wealth to advance his cause, which is why the Lord gave it to them. Now, again, think about the parable of the talents, and, and think about the fact that one was given ten, one five, and another one, okay? And each according to their ability and how they use them to serve their master. The Lord is using the same example here. The, you know, he, he will only entrust to us what he knows we can use, but not more that would become a snare to us. And it turns out that the one talent ended up becoming a snare to one of those individuals who didn't use it for God's glory, but held on to it. Okay, so God gives wealth to those who will use it for his cause, to, for, to those who will be faithful in their stewardship in using it for that purpose. But as James is warning us here, in all the other cases, okay, it can prove to be a snare to those who love it more than they love him. I mean, he warns us again and again that possessions can possess us. Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now again, even if we don't have a lot, we still have to watch out for this particular danger. Okay? And remember, the danger is not the wealth itself. That's not the problem. If it was, God would not give wealth to any believer. The problem is the love of it, okay? The love of it, it's a matter of the heart. Are we willing to give it up to him? That was the rich young ruler's downfall, which is what I read in, in our meditation. When he had a choice between wealth or Jesus, he chose his wealth, okay? And this is a common problem. And that's why Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 19, verses 23 through 24, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now remember that Jesus here is not referring to a gate called you know, the eye of the needle that camels could pass through with great difficulty if they got down on their knees, you know, and kind of, you know, worked their way through it. He was talking about camels trying to pass through a literal eye of a needle, something that is impossible. And that's exactly how the disciples understood it because they answered in verse 25, then who can be saved? If the rich man can't be saved, the one who doesn't have to work for a living, the one who has all this wealth, who has all this time, who can pursue the kingdom of heaven, who can even give to the cause of Christ. If, if he can't be saved, then how can I be saved? What chance do I have? Well, Jesus said to them in verse 26, with, with men, with people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. See, only God can give the ability to love him more than to love money. And that's the one thing that was missing in the equation, you know, and that was Jesus' diagnostic question. Do you love me more than your wealth? And the rich young ruler loved his wealth more. He could not give it up because it possessed him. Money can be very addicting, which is why the Lord generally gives it to those of the world who are not going to inherit the world which is to come. Again, Think of the rich man and Lazarus. You know, you received your good things here. Think of what Jesus said. You're receiving your comfort in full to those who are rich. Their wealth is their inheritance from the Lord. 
while the Lord has reserved the true riches for his people, for us. Now, James ends with its greatest disadvantage and what it is that, that trips up the wealthy, okay? Those who pursue wealth don't pursue the Lord. And because they're not pursuing the Lord, they're not going to be prepared for death. And again, let me quote Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. He says in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You know, Jesus could have just as easily said, you, you can't hold on to your life and serve God either. You know, you're either going to love God or you're going to love your life. God has to be first. You have to love him first of all. Now, he also taught this parable to warn of the same danger in Luke 12, verses 16 through 21. The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and, I, and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Again, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Lay up your treasures in heaven, not upon earth, because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And let's not forget those parables that he gives in the kingdom parables, uh, the pearl of great price, the treasure hidden in the field. When they found that treasure, they sold everything they had and they purchased the pearl, they purchased the field so they could possess the treasure. They gave everything for the kingdom of heaven. That's something the rich man will not do and cannot do apart from the grace of God because he loves his riches more than God. And so James writes again in James 1, verses 10 and 11, the rich man is to glory in his humiliation because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the, in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Okay, he will chase after these things and he will perish as he is pursuing them. The rich, like everyone else, one day is going to die. And then what good will these riches be to him. Now, when that time comes, and it will for everyone, Jesus is telling us our wealth is not going to do us any good. So again, let me just remind you of what Jesus says regarding the cost of discipleship, what he said to his disciples in Matthew 16, verse 24. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, and that means leave off the pursuit of riches, and take up his cross and follow me. And then he told them what would happen to those who were not willing to pay that price, but instead, you know, not denying themselves, they pursue the world instead. He says in verses 25 and 26, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I mean, Jesus is asking him the question, what do we really gain in the end if we leave off pursuing the kingdom to pursue the world and the riches of the world? He says we gain nothing, but we lose that which is most precious to us, and that is our souls. We cannot serve God and mammon. Now, riches do have value, but they only have value if we use them for God's kingdom and his glory in this life. That doesn't mean that we you know, don't use them to take care of our needs. God gives them to take care of our needs. It doesn't mean we can't have you know, recreations and so forth, but we do need to be investing in the kingdom of God. God will only give us riches 
or he'll only give us as much as he knows that we will actually use for this purpose. So I think there's also another key here, and that is if we want him to entrust more to us, we need to use what he gives us for his glory. The more we give, the more he will give to us. Now that, again, sounds like the health and wealth gospel. I'm not, that's not what I'm referring to because in the health and wealth gospel, it's the more I give, the more God's going to give me, and the more I get, the richer I'll become, and, and the more I'll have, and, and I'll be able to just enjoy all this lavish living. That, that's not what's being referred to here, but it's more along the lines of the example that Dick was reminding me of this morning. I didn't know the man's name, but I had heard the story about the man who um, had a very lucrative business. You said it was an earth-moving business, is that right? And he determined that of all the money he was making, he would live on a, on a slender portion of that. And whatever he made above that, he would give to God. And eventually, he ended up giving 90% of his income regularly to God's service while he was living on 10%. Now, that's a far cry from people, you know, I think of, uh, again, the Hearst Castle that we were able to uh, tour, how William Randolph Hearst spent all that money building this palatial mansion to enjoy and, you know, to invite people to and, you know, just, just for the, the clout. I mean, just all the money that is spent by rich people on themselves. I, I know a particular individual that um, I grew up with whose um, monthly budget is, last time I, well, saw him and asked him, he says $60,000 a month. 60000 a month, that's how much he spends. And, you know, on, on just things to to just have fun, to enjoy. So the question is, how are we going to use the money? Well, again, if we want the Lord to entrust more to us, we need to be willing to use it for His glory. The more we do, the more He will give us. But again, God, out of His love for us, will give us what He knows we will be able to handle. And as we are faithful in little, the Lord, if He is pleased to do so, will give us more. So we just simply need to love him, love him more and use what we have for his glory and his honor. Well, may the Lord give us the wisdom to be able to apply that. Let's um, bow in just a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord for, for his grace to do so.